In this video, I'm going to go over the different ways that you can answer National 5 skills questions for National 5 history. Uh, on the screen in front of you right now, you have six different timestamps that you can go to to get each a tutorial for each different question. Uh, skip to one minute in for the describe questions, for explain questions, go to five minutes 22, for compare the views questions, 10 minutes 52, for evaluate the usefulness, 20 minutes 20, for how full is 34, 20, and for nine markers, 42 minutes and 35 seconds. Also, at the end, I go through two useful links for the SQA website and how to access past papers and their marking instructions, as well as the BBC Bite Size website. What I do within each section is, uh, first of all, go over the structure and where you're going to get marks, uh, but then I also go into actual examples. So if you'd like to see some examples of how some of these questions are, are answered uh, and in the correct format, make sure you skip to the one that you most definitely need a hand with. For this section, we're going to look at describe questions. So as it says on the screen just now, describe questions are knowledge questions, which means this is purely based on your own knowledge. There is no source that you can get any marks from. Uh, the describe questions will be worth four marks, and it's important that you make four separate points. But you need to make sure that you're describing in these points. So do not list uh, factors. Make sure that you're actually giving a proper description and you're going into some detail about it. So I'll show you an example of what we have here. So what we've got here is a question which asks to describe the different stages of the triangular trade. And that is worth four marks. Now, as you're obviously thinking, triangular trade, three sides, but there are different points along the triangular trade that you can also draw from here. So what you need to do is when you see a question like this, you must make sure that you're using the wording of the question to formulate your answer. So question asked, describe the different stages of the triangular trade. I will start off by saying one stage of the triangular trade was. And then from there, it's up to me to go and describe that, um, that stage. So we start off by saying was the passage from Britain to West Africa. And whilst if I stop there, I'm not going to get the mark because you can see that that's not really a description. I've not really said what happens along uh, that passage. So I need to make sure that I include a bit more detail there. So this is where I put a wee comma and say carrying manufactured goods such as guns or you could include pots and pans and um, clothing that sort of thing so i've done one but it's important that we do four so again i'll go on and use the wording of the question again another stage of the triangular trade was so here i would want to almost follow with um, follow that triangular trade in my head so when those ships got to west africa what happened there and it was a case of Another stage of the triangular trade was the trading of manufactured goods on the west coast of Africa for enslaved Africans. So we've got two marks there. And once you've realised that, you've still got at least the middle passages to go and the return passages that brings um, sugar and cotton back to the Caribbean. So I'll quickly run through how that would look. So another stage of the triangular trade was the middle passage. And again, it is really important that we make sure we're describing the middle passage here. It's not enough for us just to, uh, just to list the middle passage. We need to give some sort of description. So I would say the transported enslaved Africans from West Africa to Caribbean, which is probably a good description in itself. I might just add in a little bit more just to make sure I've got enough detail in awful conditions. Again, this isn't asking you to go into four different points, but the middle passage, that would come up as a separate question. As long as you're just describing that, you're given some detail of the middle passage, that will get them up. And finally, I would put in another point, another stage of the triangular trade was the shipping of raw materials. such as cotton and sugar from the Caribbean to Britain. 
So as we can see there, folks, what we've got is we've got four separate points that will get us the four marks. Again, we must make sure that we're not just listing these points. We need to make sure that we're going into some form of detail to actually get the marks. These, again, because they're purely from your own knowledge, you don't have a source to lean on, so it's important that we know these topics and we can bring in four points. Um, but these are really good uh, places for us to get marks on. The next question that I'm going to do a tutorial on is the explain questions. So as before with describe questions, these are knowledge questions. You will not have a source to lean on to get any marks. It is purely from your own knowledge. Uh, these are worth six marks, so rather than a describe question, there's two more marks. And again, you need to make six de uh, separate points. The difference between a describe and an uh, explain question is in an explain question, your points must be developed. So there, it's quite a lot of information that you're going to have in, to include in each of your six points. And you need to make sure that you've clearly answered that question um, and linked it back to the question, showing a reason for a historical development or event. So if we look at the example that we have here, I have a question that asks, explain the reasons why Scots volunteered to fight in the Great War. So just as I would have done for the described questions, I want to use the wording of the question to formulate my answer. So I will start off by saying, one reason why Scots volunteered to fight in the Great War was. And here is where I want to think of an example. Um, so there are lots of examples that we could choose from. The first one that I'm going to go for here, uh, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, uh, having done this in the nine mark version, um, was poverty. So I'll put that there. Now, obviously, this is not going to get me the mark because I now need to explain how poverty was a reason that forced Scots to volunteer to fight in the Great War. So I almost want to think of each point as being split up into two sentences. So I've used my introduction. I've, I've started this off. One reason why Scott has volunteered to fight in the Great War was poverty. And now I'm going to explain that. So I will say this is because. So now I need to explain and really set the scene of why poverty was a reason why Scots went to fight in the Great War and make sure that I tie that back uh, to the question. So I would say this is because many Scots were unemployed, so that obviously explains the poverty aspect of it. Um, but now I need to make sure I say how that led Scots to volunteer. What was the incentive? So volunteering offered them a steady wage to support their families. So what I've done there is I've quite clearly outlined, okay, Scots living in poverty, some are unemployed, Okay, so what? So why did that lead Scots to fight? Well, it led them to fight because they could get money, they could get a steady wage, they could go and support their families. So that's a solid point there. If I wanted to bring in another point, I could go on and talk about any other reason. And again, I'm using the word in the question every single time to formulate my answer. So another reason why Scots volunteered to fight in the Great War was... And I'm going to think of another point here. I, uh, let's talk about propaganda. Now, there's different forms of propaganda you could bring in here. You could talk about patriotic propaganda, things that showed men in kilts, and that really appealing to the Scottish martial tradition. You know, the idea of going to fight in a kilt and impress people back home, that was something that really appealed to them. But in this case, I'm going to talk about anti-German propaganda. So I would say this is because posters around Britain showed... German atrocities in Europe. So, for example, the idea of them killing uh, innocent civilians in Belgium. Posters would have went around um, Scotland and Britain at the time, and stories about this would have went around Britain. And what this does is that makes Scots want to go and defend Britain from such German atrocities, right? So if I stopped my point here, I would obviously not get the mark, because I need to tie it back to the question. This is because posters around Britain showed German atrocities in Europe, Yes, so what? So how did that lead Scots to fight? Well, Scots enlisted to defend Britain from these atrocities. So that, but the idea of that, you know, sparking within them this sense that they get to go and they should be the ones that, uh, that will defend their country from that from happening. So I'll show you here, I have prepared one earlier that shows you a full uh, example. So if I scroll down here... What we have is explain the reason why Scots volunteered to fight in the Great War. And as you can see here, I've got six points. One, two, three, four, five, six. I've also talked about Pals Battalions. This is because Scots were excited about enlisting as they could go to war with friends or colleagues rather than strangers. 
I've got peer pressure here. This is because women gave men who did not volunteer a white feather as a symbol of cowardice. And the important point that I add in here is forcing Scots to volunteer to avoid the shame, right? That's the point that really links it back to the question that says why this led Scots to volunteer. If it stopped at cowardice, it's not really clear how that led Scots to volunteer. So that's tying it back up. Uh, other things, opportunity to travel. This is because many Scots could not afford to travel. So unless this is it maybe their only opportunity to see places like France or Belgium. And the figure one I've put in here was the short war theory. People believe that the war would be over by Christmas, so Scots enlisted because they did not want to miss their chance. Again, you could talk about many other things here. You could talk about patriotism. Again, you could talk about the patriotic propaganda that we talked about. But there are various reasons why Scots would volunteer. But as we said before, for the explained questions, all you need is six points. Make sure you develop them. Now I'm going to look at the compare the views questions and these are our first source question that we're going to look at. So compare the views questions ask you to essentially analyse two sources. So you'll be given two sources in front of you and you need to decide whether they agree or disagree on a certain topic, event or development. It's important to know that your sources will always either fully agree or fully disagree. There will never be a case where it's a bit of one and a bit of the other. It's either always that they fully agree or they fully disagree. So it's important to know that compare the views questions are worth four marks. You get your first mark by giving an overall comparison. So that's just generally saying, do the sources agree or disagree on the topic in question? And you use the word another question for that. Then you want to look to give a simple comparison. So you're wanting to look for two specific quotes, one from source, one from the first source and one from the second source. And you need to say what they are agreeing about or disagreeing about. So summarise that agreement or disagreement. And then your developed comparison is when you back that up, when you give the quotes that they either agree or that show they agree or disagree. Now, what you'll notice is that is only three points there. So if you only did an overall comparison and if you only did a simple and a developed comparison, the maximum you can get is three out of four. So it's important that you give at least two simple and developed comparisons to ensure that you get the four out of four. And I'll show you how that works just now. So what I've got here is I've got two sources in front of us. Um, uh, the question asks to compare the views of sources A and B about the methods used by abolitionists. So source A and source B both talking about abolitionists and I need to decide whether they agree or disagree. So source A states, the abolitionists use a variety of methods to put a stop to the slave trade. Personal accounts change public opinion as the dreadful experiences of the slaves during the Middle Passage were told by survivors. Many slavers back these up, giving similar accounts about the horrors of the trade. Abolitionists such as Clarkson toured the country with equipment used in slaves to show the public how badly they were treated. Source B states, the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade was set up by Thomas Clarkson and Granville Sharp. Clarkson travelled around Britain with instruments such as manacles and thumb screws to gain support for the cause. John Newton, former slaver, published a pamphlet outlining the horrific conditions of the slave trade and confirming slave accounts. Some slaves, such as Alauda Equiano, published autobiographies sharing their experiences and changing the views of the public. So we'd hope that after you were reading both of those, you would see that they're both generally talking and they're both in agreement there about the methods used by abolitionists because Source A and Source B are both talking about what Ella de Equiano did, what Thomas Clarkson did, and what former slavers such as John Newton did. So what I need to start off with is, again, I need to start off with my overall comparison. And the best way to do that is literally just to start off with overall. And I will say overall, Sources A and B agree. But I must make sure to point out what they agree about. And the best way to do that is to look again at the wording of the question. So you can see here, the wording of the question asks about the methods used by abolitionists. So that's exactly what I'm going to say in this almost introduction. So overall, sources A and B agree about the methods used by abolitionists. And what that does is straight away that gets me one mark because I've given an overall comparison. But now what I need to do is I need to look for specific examples of where they agree. So this is where I'm going to start to look in detail. So again, when I want to indicate that I'm going to look in detail, the best way to do that is just to say in detail. So I'm going to look specifically and see what uh, the sources agree about. And a good way of doing this, and you can do this in an exam, you can do this in a prelim, is you can write on um, your exam paper. You can underline, you can highlight whatever 
makes it easier for you to identify where the sources are in agreement or disagreement. The best way to do that is to look for words that are quite similar across both sources. So the one that jumped out at me straight away, even just looking at this here, is the word Clarkson. Because I can see that that is both in source A and in source B. So if I look at what source A says, abolitionists such as Clarkson toured the country with equipment used in slaves to show the public how badly they were treated. And if I look at source B and I highlight Clarkson again, Clarkson travelled around Britain with instruments such as manacles and thumbscrews to gain support for the cause. So the best thing to do here is to highlight your full points. So go here, highlight that in yellow, and I'll do the exact same for the quotes in source B. Highlighting those in yellow. So what those two quotes are agreeing about is those two quotes are agreeing about the methods used by Thomas Clarkson. That's, so that's how I start off my point. Here is my simple comparison. In detail, sources A and B agree. And again, it's important to always establish that. Every time we're always establishing that sources A and B agree or they disagree. Agree about the methods used by Thomas Clarkson. So you've made a claim, you said in detail sources A and B agree about the method used by Thomas Clarkson, so now it's important that we back that up for that developed comparison mark. So this is where we give the quotes that back up your claim. So I would say source A states, and here is where I would give the quote from source A. And I'm just going to be a bit lazy here, and I'm going to copy and paste it. We need to make sure that obviously we are copying these out. Source A states, Abolitionists such as Clarkson toured the country with equipment used on slaves to show how uh, badly they were treated. And in here is when I say, oops, no colour, source B, and it's important that we put this here, folks, agrees when it states. We're always establishing that, always agreeing, they're always agreeing, they're always agreeing. Or if the source is disagreed, they're always disagreeing, they're always disagreeing, they're always disagreeing. And quotation marks here, and I would go and take the point here. Copy this. And putting that in there. So what we see here is we have an overall comparison. So we've said overall sources A and B agree about the method used by abolitionists. In detail, sources A and B agree about the method used by Thomas Clarkson. That's our simple comparison. So with these two sentences, this one and this one, we have two marks. And here is my developed comparison, where I use the quotes to back that up. But you'll notice that that only gives me three out of four. So what I need to do is I need to repeat this process one more time for another separate set of quotes. And here is how I would do that. I've done this in an earlier version. So again, if we look, I've highlighted the two, um, the various points in the sources that agree. So the points highlighted in light blue, personal accounts change public opinion as the dreadful experiences of the slaves during the Middle Passage were told by survivors. Source B, highlighted in blue, some slaves, such as Alouda Equiano, published autobiographies sharing their experiences and changing the views of the public. If I scroll down, I can see that. I've not put that one in, but I've used the one on slavers. So source A in yellow says... Many slavers back these up, giving similar accounts uh, about the horrors of the trade. Uh, source B agrees with that. John Newton, former slaver, published a pamphlet outlining the horrific conditions of the slave trade and confirming slave accounts. So what those two points are agreeing about is they're agreeing about the accounts of former slavers. So here is how I would do that point. Sources A and B also agree about former slavers, given their accounts of the slave trade. So that gets me one mark for a simple comparison. Source A states many slavers back these up giving similar accounts about the horrors of the trade source b agrees when it states john newton former slaver published a pamphlet outlining the horrific conditions of the slave trade and confirming slave accounts so with this process this one here i've got two marks with this process here i've got another two marks so i've definitely got four out of four but this also is my overall one. And that makes sure that I've always got that insurance of that extra mark. It always guarantees me the four out of four. 
Usually, your comparative views questions will always have at least three things that they agree about, but some are always more difficult than others to actually identify. In this case, it's quite easy to see where the three um, the three points agree agree about, but you only need to give two points of agreement to get your four out of four. But these should be very simple. Um, again, only four marks, and as long as you know the structure, you would not need to know anything about the topic to make sure that you get at least four out of four. So practice these to make sure that we're comfortable with these. So for this section, we're going to look at evaluate the usefulness questions. So this again is a source question. So what will be presented in front of you is a source re related to a question, um, but you'll also be given other information as well. You'll also be given who it was from, so who wrote it or who spoke it. You'll be given a date um, when it was published, and you also might be given, um, for example, the type of source that is. So it could be a diary, a speech, or from a newspaper. But the main thing that you want to concern yourself with is the author, the date, and the things that are in the source. So in total, evaluate the usefulness questions are worth five marks. Uh, and it's important that when you're doing those five marks, so you're going to make five points. And it's important that within each one, you're always evaluating the usefulness of the point that you're making. If you do not evaluate the usefulness uh, to the degree that is expected, then that means that you will not get the mark especially when it comes to evaluating the usefulness of the author and the date. You must make sure that when you're evaluating the usefulness of the author and the date, that you link it to the wording of the question. So I'll show you an example that we have here. So here we have a question that asks us to evaluate the usefulness of source C as evidence of the events of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. So the Nazis and Adolf Hitler's uh, attempt to overthrow the German Weimar Republic in Munich in November of 1923. So straight away, we can see that source C uh, asks us here. So source C is from a textbook written by a modern historian in 1999. So the first thing I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to highlight the fact that it was written by a modern historian. And I'm also going to highlight the fact that it was written in 1999, because those two things are going to be really crucial for me later on in uh, my answer. Uh, what I'll also do now is I'll read the source. So outside the beer hall, a shot was fired, and the next instant, many shots rang out from both sides. Hitler's meetings were usually very well attended because of his public speaking skills. More shooting started, after which 16 Nazis and three policemen lay dead or dying on the streets of Munich, and many more were wounded. Several Nazis fled the scene, including Hitler. However, the Nazi party would recover to challenge the authorities again. Okay, So what we need to do is we need to find two quotes from the source that give me like it says here, evidence of the events of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. So it has to, the quotes have to be about that. Some of the quotes in here will be what we call distractors. And these are things that aren't quite linked to the question. So whilst they might be true, they're not about uh, the question in hand. And I'll show you how this works. So if I go back to the source, the first sentence says, Outside the beer hall, a shot was fired, and the next instant, many uh, shots rang out from both sides. Straight away, I know that that is indeed an event of the beer hall putsch, so I can highlight that, because I know that that's something that I'm going to use later on. The next sentence, Hitler's meetings were usually very well attended because of his public speaking skills. Now here's a great example of a distractor. Whilst that's true, Hitler's meetings were indeed very well attended because of his public speaking skills. It is not about the events of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. It is not linked to the question. Therefore, that is a distractor quote. Next, more shooting started, after which 16 Nazis and three policemen lay dead or dying in the streets of Munich, and many more were wounded. So again, what we've got here is we have a quote that has definitely given me an example of something that happened during the beer hall putsch. So I'm going to highlight that as well because that is indeed an event. The next sentence, several Nazis fled the scene, including Hitler. So again, I'm going to highlight that because that is indeed, oops, that is indeed an event of the beer hall putsch. So that's here, oops. Da, da, da. There we go. And then the final sentence, however, the Nazi party would recover to challenge the authorities again. There is another example of a distractor quote. That, whilst again, that is true, the Nazi party would recover to challenge the authorities again. It is not evidence of the events of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. Therefore, I cannot use it. 
So as I said before, we only need to use two quotes from the source. What I'm going to use is I'm going to use the first and third ones because they're nice and short. So that might save me a bit of time. So I'm going to say source C states. I'm going to give the quote here. So the quote says outside the beer hall, shot was fired and in the next instant many shots rang out from both sides full stop and end quote so that's my quote but remember for me to get the mark here I need to make sure that I evaluate the usefulness of this quote so this is how I do that I say this increases the source's usefulness as it is accurate information. And that is the exact same evaluation I'm going to give for my next quote. If I do not give that point in bold there, I cannot get the mark. So we repeat that again. Source C states, quote, several Nazis fled the scene, including Hitler. stop and end quote and remember as I said before I cannot get the mark unless I put the following this increases the source's usefulness as it is accurate information so what we're really doing is we're looking to see here if we were wanting to find out about the beer hall pooch would this be useful yes indeed it would because it is accurate therefore it is something that we can use so I've got my two points from the source. There's no point in me using that third point because I can only get a maximum of two out of five for uh, the points in the source. So I'm going to move on now to the things from my own knowledge. So source C omits. So these are things that are not in the source. So the source doesn't describe various things about the beer hall pooch. The first thing I can think of is that source C omits that Hitler fired a shot in the air and declared the national revolution has begun, right? Because that's exactly what happened. But the problem is I can't get the mark for that because what I've not done is I've not evaluated the usefulness of, the, of how, how that makes the source more or less useful. And because the source does not describe that, because the source does not include that, that makes the source less useful. So that's what I will say. This decreases the source's usefulness. The reason that is, is because that's not in the source, so it's leaving out a key detail about the beer hall pooch. Again, I'll do that one more time. Source C also omits that Hitler dislocated his shoulder as he fled the pooch. Again, I can't get the mark until I say this decreases the source's what I've got there is four points and that's given me four marks but remember this is out of five so to get that fifth mark to get full marks I now need to go back to the source and say okay I can't use anything else from the source I know I can use the other quote but again I can only get a maximum of two from the source so what I need to do now is I need to look at the author or the date so as we see here source C is from a textbook written by a modern historian in 1999 so what I'm going to start off with is I'm going to start analysing the usefulness of the author. So this is how I do that. I say, source C is written by, and then I'll put in exactly who it was written by. A modern historian. So now I need to evaluate the usefulness of that person. So as a historian, they are going to likely have been well researched. They will have you know, spent a lot of time looking at this sort of thing. So the idea is that they will be useful because they are likely to give us uh, accurate and true information. So that's what I will say. I will say this increases the source's usefulness as they are an, and the key word here is expert. But it's important that we say what well, exactly they're an expert on. It's not enough for us just to stop there. It's not enough for us just to say the topic. We need to make sure that we link this to the question. So the question asks us, 
about the events of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, so that's what I'll say. This increases the source's usefulness as they're an expert in the events of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. If I do not put that at the end, I cannot get the mark. I need to be specific with my evaluation. I need to link it to the question. And that goes exactly the same for the date. I would recommend evaluating the usefulness of both the author and the date because that means at least if you get one wrong, you've got a wee insurance mark to get your five out of five. Even though this will be six points, it makes sure that you can get five out of five. It also helps you if you can only uh, think of one thing that the source omits, this will give you that extra mark. So source C was written in. So the date it was written in, a reminder again, 1999. Now, a lot of people are really tempted here to say that this decreases the source's usefulness because it was after uh, the events of the Beer Hall Putsch. But what we need to remember is when historians are writing about things in the past, they're looking back on it and they've got like the full picture. They can see what came after it. They can look at what came before it. So actually, it gives us good context. So the way to answer this is, I would say, this increases the source's usefulness as it was written, and the key point here is after, right, written after, and here is where I need to be specific again, I need to say after the events of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, right, but what I've not actually said here is I've not said why that's useful, yeah, so why it's written after the events, why is that useful? So like I said before, if it was written after, this is where I put giving it the benefit of hindsight. So that's a key point that I put in there. If I don't put that given the benefit of the hindsight and if I don't link it to the wording of the question like I've done here, I cannot get the mark for that. The timing, the date point is the hardest one to get because you've got a few things to remember there, but it's a good thing to remember. Now, with evaluate the usefulness questions, it's quite interesting because sometimes you'll get a source, uh, at least one of your sources will not be by a modern historian and it will not be written after the event, but it will be written by a primary source. And I have an example of that uh, right here. So I scroll down to my evaluate the usefulness. So there's the one that we just did. But what I've got here is another example. So. Source A uh, as evidence of the conditions faced by slaves during the Middle Passage. And this time, it's written by, as you can see highlighted in yellow here, a slave ship doctor. And it was written in 1788. So this is where my answer for the author changes slightly. Um, as I say here, Source A, so I'll direct your attention here, Source A was written by a slave ship doctor. So I start off the exact same way I say who it was written by. This increases the source's usefulness as, and instead of saying expert like I did with the historian, I now need to say what type of experience they have with the, the event in question. So because this is a slave ship doctor, that means that they're getting paid for it. Therefore, it would be professional experience. If, for example, it was written by an enslaved person themselves, I might say instead personal experience. Right. But in this case, it is professional experience. Just put that back in. So this is what I would say. This increases the source's usefulness as they have professional experience with. And again, it's not enough just to say the topic. We need to say exactly what it's about. And then go back to the wording of the question, the conditions faced by slaves during the Middle Passage. So that's exactly what I put in my evaluation of the author. Same goes for the date. Source C is written in 1788. So this increases the source's usefulness as it was written during, not after like we did before with the historian. It was written during the time enslaved people were transported on the Middle Passage. Linked to the question, not during the time or during the event, linking it specifically to the question. Folks, with the value of the usefulness when you're talking about the author and the date, you need to make sure that you are being specific to the question. Otherwise, you're running the risk that you will not get the full five marks. And these are crucial marks that will pick, you will pick up as you go along throughout the exam. Okay, folks, so in this example, we're going to look at our final types of source questions that we've got. And these are how fully questions. So again, as I said, these are source questions and they're worth six marks. So you get three points from... Uh, 
identify and correct the points from the source, but you also must make sure that they're reworded or explained what they mean. Um, you're not bringing in anything new at that point. You're really just saying what your quotes mean. And then your other three points, other three marks come from your mission points. So what is not in the source, but what the question is asking about. You need to make sure that you also include a judgment sentence and I would do this right at the start of your how fully questions because if you do not include a judgment sentence, you can only get a maximum of two out of six. Now, how fully questions will be worded slightly differently. So you get two different types of wordings. The first, how fully does source X describe something and how fully does source Y explain something? So for example, how fully does source X describe the living and working conditions of slaves in the plantations? And then otherwise, you could also get how fully does source Y explain the reasons why some women were given the vote. They're much the same as the difference between describe and explain questions where you're really just looking, you're not really looking for anything really different. You're just looking for a wee bit more detail from the source itself. But the way you, nothing changes in the way you do and the way you answer this question. So if I look here to this example that I've got, uh, I've got the one that I just described. How fully does Source D describe the living and working conditions of slaves on the plantations? So Source D, uh, approximately 12 million Africans were taken to the Caribbean to work on the plantations. Slaves were forced to work 12 hours a day, 12 hour days at harvest time, this could be much more. If slaves did not work hard, they would be whipped by the overseers. Many slaves struggled to work these long hours. The food that was given to them was cheap and of poor quality, rarely including meat. Slaves were often made to build their own shacks by the overseers. So what I'm going to do with this, folks, is I'm going to start off by, before I even look at this horse, I need to make sure that I get my judgment sentence out of the way. And my judgment sentence will always go like this. Source D... Oops. Source D, partly. So source D, partly, and then I look to the question for the word of my judgment sentence. Source D, partly, describes the living and working conditions of slaves on plantations. So source D, partly, describes the living and working conditions of slaves on plantations. Again, folks, I don't get one mark for that. That's only a judgment sentence, but if I don't include that, I can only get a maximum of two out of six. Remember, the question is asking you how fully does source D describe something? The answer is always that it can never fully describe something. So it's always partly describe something. And then that gives you the authority to then go on and give points from the source. So like I've done before, I'm going to look through the source and I'm going to look for points that, yes, do indeed give me um, living and working conditions of slaves on the plantations. But if you remember from the previous examples, we need to always be on the lookout for distractor sentences. And these are things that, whilst true, are not linked to our question. So if we read the first sentence, approximately 12 million Africans were taken to the Caribbean to work on the plantations. That would be a distractor sentence. Yes, approximately 12 million Africans were taken to the Caribbean to work in the plantations, but it does not describe the living and working conditions of slaves on the plantations. Second sentence, slaves were forced to work 12 hour days. At harvest time, this could be much more. Again, that is spot on, so I'm going to go and I'm going to highlight that because I know that that's a point that I'm going to bring in to my answer. Uh, third sentence, if slaves did not work hard enough, they would be whipped by the overseers. Again, another accurate point that does indeed describe the living and working conditions. So I'm going to highlight that because I'm going to use that later on. Uh, many slaves struggle to work these long hours. So that is a fair point, um, but it's not really a description of their living and working conditions. Uh, I would want to see something that's a bit more detailed there. So I would call that a distractor as well. The next sentence, the food that was given to them was cheap and of poor quality, really including meat. Again, that's a good description. So I'm going to highlight that. And finally, slaves were often made to build their own shacks by the overseers. Again, a perfect description of what uh, enslaved people were forced to experience on plantations. So I'm going to highlight that as well. The thing is, folks, I only need to use three from the source. So I'm going to choose three. Uh, I'm going to choose... The first three. So I will start off by saying source D states, and then I'm going to give my quote. So source D states, slaves were forced to work 12 hour days.
at harvest time, this could be much more. Full stop and end quote. So remember, I've given the quote, but to get the mark, I need to make sure that I'm explaining what that quote means. So by that, I mean putting it into my own words. What is that quote really saying? So this means that. So <coughs> with the SQA, the SQA are still using terminology like slaves. Um, and if you're thinking, I can't find a, uh, think of a way to reword that term, you don't have to worry about that because uh, certainly if you're in one of my classes, the term that we will use is enslaved person or enslaved African. So I would say this means that enslaved people had to work very long hours. So I'm just explaining what that means. That could also increase at certain times of year. So that's really what the quote is saying, because the quote is saying that they work 12 hour days, so that's, you know, the very long hours, and at harvest time, this could be much more, so that's why I say this could also increase at certain times of year, so that'd be around about the summertime. I do this again, so is the states, and I give another quote, uh, if slaves did not work hard enough, they would be whipped by overseers, full stop, in quotation marks. So again, looking to explain what that quote means, looking to reword it, uh, they're using the term slave, so I'm going to use a different term. I'm going to say this means that enslaved people would be harshly punished. Instead of saying whipped, I'm saying harshly punished if the overseers thought they were not or something like that, okay? Uh, what I'll show you is I'll show you my answer that I came up with earlier on, and it looks a little bit like this. So this will give you a full example. So scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. So here it is. So what I'm gonna highlight here is I'm gonna highlight my three points from the source. So like I said before, I've used the two quotes, but my third one was the food that was given to them was cheap and of poor quality, rarely including meat. So I've reworded that by saying, this means that enslaved people's food was poor and not very nutritious and their diets lacked meat. So, you know, just saying what the quote's saying, not bringing in anything new, but essentially explaining what it means. Here is where I get my other three marks though, because remember it's important that we can only get three from the source and then we need to get three from our own knowledge. So the things that I've chosen here include uh, however, source D admits that enslaved people would cut their knuckles when they cut down the sugar cane. So, you know, when they're hacking at the sugar cane with a knife, sometimes that would wrap the knuckles and that would cause them to get quite bloody at the end of the day. Uh, source D also admits that enslaved people worked in sugar boiling houses, which were extremely warm and many passed out due to the heat. Again, that's describing a working condition. And source D also admits that enslaved women of, often worked in the plantation house and sometimes faced sexual assault. So again, that's another working condition. Other living conditions you could talk about are, you know, the lack, um, lack of protection against mosquitoes. Mosquitoes can spread disease. Having to live in, um, in shacks and huts that had up to, you know, 10 enslaved people themselves, poor furniture. There's really anything that you could bring in there that isn't in the source. Uh, there's loads that you could talk about there. So folks, out of six, I need to make sure I've got three from my own knowledge, three from the source, and I also need to make sure that I'm always including this judgment sentence because without that, I can only get two out of six. Also, if you only put three from the source and you don't include anything from your own knowledge, even with three valid points from the source, you will also be limited at two out of six. So make sure that you get at least one thing from your own knowledge and to ensure that you're getting the maximum amount of marks that you possibly can. The final question that we're going to look at for the National 5 exam is nine markers, so otherwise known as short essay questions. So again, much like the describe and the explain questions, this is purely a knowledge question, so you have no source to fall back on. This is purely what you know about a certain question, topic, um, or piece of content. So as it says in the... Um, in the description, in the title, they're worth nine marks. And here's how you get those nine marks. So you get one mark for the introduction. And in your introduction, what you need to do is you need to outline the factors that you're going to discuss. And in total, you will outline three factors because you'll have three paragraphs in the middle of your essay. So you'll have five in total, an introduction, three for um, your different factors, and then you'll have a conclusion. Uh, you will also get five knowledge marks. So this is where you make five relevant points linked to the question that answer the question. Uh, much like in an, in an explained question, this is how you get those marks. Uh, 
You get one balance mark, so this is where you automatically get a mark just by discussing an alternative factor, and I'll show you how you get that in a little second. And then you get two conclusion marks. You get one mark for stating what the most important factor is, and then you give you get another mark for giving the supporting reason. So the nine markers, most of the ones that we have looked at, at will have isolated factors, and I'm going to show you what that means just now. So the question I've got in front of me is, to what extent was the machine gun the most effective weapon on the Western Front during World War I? So if I'm looking at that question, what it's really asking me is this. What was the most effective weapon on the Western Front during World War I? That's really what the question is asking me. What it is also giving me, though, is it is giving me an isolated factor. And by that, I mean it's asking me, okay, to what extent was the machine gun the most effective weapon in the Western Front? So that means I, need to, I know that I need to talk about the machine gun, but I also know that I need to talk about two other factors because to really, really to answer this question, I need to compare the machine gun to other weapons to really be able to confidently and definitively say what the most effective weapon on the Western Front was. So when I'm looking at this, I would think, okay, I've got the machine gun as one factor, but two other factors that I could bring in, the ones I'm going to discuss, are gas and tanks. Now, you don't need to include those bullet points. I'm just putting them there to show you uh, what I would do in that scenario. I could also talk about uh, planes, um, because it's not talking about new technology. I can talk about rifles. I could also talk about artillery if I wanted to. But in this case, like I said before, we only need three factors. So the ones that I'm going to discuss are machine gun, tanks and gas. So I start off my question with the introduction. So this is the first paragraph. And I start off by just introducing the topic. And again, I'm going to use the wording of the question for this. So the question asks, to what extent was the machine gun the most effective weapon in the Western Front during World War One? I? I will say there were many effective weapons on the Western Front during World War One. So that's my first sentence. But I've not got the mark yet because I've not outlined the factors. This is me setting the scene. This is me saying, here is what my essay is going to talk about. So these include machine guns, and that's obviously the isolated factor, the one in the question. But I'm also going to talk about gas, and I'm also going to talk about tanks. So the easiest way to start this off is for the first paragraph, you are going to talk about maybe the one that's in the question. So for example, uh, in this one, it is the machine gun. So we'll start off again by using the wording of the question. One effective weapon on the Western Front was the machine gun. So I've introduced that. That's my topic sentence. So I've introduced the topic and I'm going to discuss now the effectiveness of that weapon. Now what's really good with this is for nine markers, um, you can do this one of two ways. Right, so this way is where I'm going to just talk about the positives of the machine gun, right? Now, the way I quite like to do this and the way I teach my classes to do this is to take a two-sentence approach, right? So the first sentence that I'm going to put in after my topic sentence is a little description of the machine gun. Uh, so, for example, I'll say, this is because it could fire up to 600 rounds Oops, I'll just change that. So this is because it can fire up to 600 rounds per minute. So that's a little description of what it is. But the problem with that is I've not said how that makes it effective, right? So the way the reason I take a two-sentence approach is to make sure that I'm always linking it back to the question. So that's why in my second sentence I will say this made the machine gun effective because, and this is where I will say how that made it effective. So I'll just say, because it killed enemies quickly and efficiently. Dead easy, because I've given a little fact about the machine gun, and then I've explained, essentially explained, like an explained question, explained its effectiveness. Um, I'm going to talk about another positive as well, because the machine gun is quite an effective weapon on the Western Front, so I'm going to give another positive factor about it. So I'm going to say, furthermore, later models of the machine gun were lighter and could be carried across no man's land. 
So again, using my two sentence approach. Um, I've given a little description. I've said what the machine gun can do, but I've not said why that's effective. So that's where my second sentence links it back to the question. So I say, this made machine gun effective because it could be used to take out large numbers of enemies in their own trenches or other things like the machine gun would cause them to run away just because of how destructive it was. So what I've got here is, I'm going to highlight this, so here's my first sentence. So it's a little fact about machine guns. And then here's my second sentence that links it back to the question. So this made the machine gun effective because it killed enemies quickly and efficiently. Again, I want to go for two points per paragraph. So here's another little knowledge mark, uh, little knowledge point. So a little fact about the machine guns. Doesn't quite get the mark. So to ensure I get the mark, I use the second sentence, linking it back to the question. And what I've done here is I've got two marks. Um, but given that little point that's in blue in both of them, that gets me a mark each time because that guarantees that I'm talking about the effectiveness of the machine gun. So once I've given two points for that factor, I'm going to go on now and I'm going to talk about my second factor. And in this case, I'm going to go on to talk about gas. So I say another effective weapon on the Western Front was gas. So again, taking the two sentence approach, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a little description of how gas was used. So say this is because gas could be used to cause blistering or blindness. Again, it's quite a vague point, but it's a, it's a good description, but it doesn't get the mark. So this is why I use the two sentence approach, linking it back to the question in the second sentence. This was effective as. So why was it effective? As it took out a large number of enemies. It took out a large number of enemies as blindness. It meant the they could not, uh, they could not attack, something like that. So there's a little positive about uh, gas. So again, you know, here's a little fact highlighted in yellow. Not quite got the, the mark yet though. So here in blue, highlighted in blue, is where I link it back to the question to get mark. But the good thing is with nine markers is I don't always have to give positives. So what I can now start to think of is I can start to think of counter arguments. So for example, instead of saying furthermore, as I did in the machine gun paragraph, I'm going to use a different word than I'm going to say however. So what I'm going to do now is give a weakness of gas. Um, and really this is a counter argument of why gas was less effective. So I'll give out again, using the two sentence approach, saying what made gas less effective. So I'd say however, if the wind changed, Gas can blow back on your own trench. Full stop. And again, just to make sure I get the mark using the two sentence approach, I'll say this made gas less effective as it could blind your own soldiers. So again, highlighted in yellow here. A little fact about gas, highlighted in blue here. Oops. Uh, sorry, folks. And highlighted in blue there is the point that links it back to the question and gets the mark. So what I've seen here is in my introduction, I've got one mark for given the introduction. And in this paragraph, I've got two marks. Uh, one for talking about the 600 rounds per minute, making it very deadly. Another mark for talking about how later models were lighter and can be carried across no man's land and take out enemies in trenches. I've got another two marks here, talking about gas, saying how it could cause blindness, uh, it meant they couldn't attack. And then I've got another mark here for saying the weakness of gas. Now the good thing is, if we go back, we uh, talked about a balance mark. Automatically, by giving a valid point about gas, what I've done is... I've given an alternative factor. So that automatically gives me another mark because I've brought in balance. I've showed that I can consider not just <coughs> the weapon in the question, the machine gun, but I can also discuss tanks. 
Finally, I'm going to go on and do another paragraph on the final weapon that I was talking about, and that will be tanks. So, another effective weapon on the Western Front was the tank. So again, using the two-sentence approach. This is because it gave cover for advancing soldiers, right? So that's a good point. They might even get a mark in itself, but again, I like to take that two-sentence approach to be sure. This made the tank effective as it allowed soldiers to advance. take enemy trenches. Again, great point there. So use the two sentence approach. Here's the one in yellow. Given a little fact. And here's me analysing it. Here's me saying how that helped. How that was effective. But again, like I did with gas, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a counter argument. So I'm going to start off my counter argument with however. Uh, and here's a weakness of tanks. <coughs> so the tank was very slow and often got stuck in the mud. So there's a good fact, but it's not talked about why it's less effective. So I would say this made the tank less effective as it left soldiers inside exposed to enemy fire. So again, highlighting in yellow here. Here's my little fact. Not quite got the mark for that yet. But then when I highlight this one in blue, there's where the mark is secured and guaranteed. Okay. The final thing that needs to be done to finish off your nine markers, though, is your conclusion. And the best way to start that off to indicate to the marker is just by saying, in conclusion. And this is where you make a judgment on the question. So it's asking, to what extent was the machine gun the most effective weapon in the Western Front? You need to say what you think the most effective one was. And in this case, I'm going to say the machine gun. It's almost easier as well, because if, you've, if you can't think of anything and you're struggling, if you just put this sentence, you can get yourself one mark for a conclusion. Even just not by knowing anything, you can just look at the isolated factor and you can get a mark. So in conclusion, the most effective weapon on the Western Front during World War One was... And the machine gun and just by saying that just by saying that one thing i've not really even thought of anything just by saying that i get a mark because i've given a judgment on what the most effective weapon was but now to get my final mark to guarantee it i need to get i need to support that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use something similar to what i said before <coughs> this is because the machine gun could fire up to 600 rounds per minute and again using that two cents approach this made the machine gun very effective as it was very deadly and could be used by inexperienced soldiers something like that so folks, what you'll see here is two marks for conclusion, one mark for the introduction, and a one balance mark by giving an alternative factor. What you'll see here is I've actually made six knowledge points. I only get five, but by doing six, I make sure that I'm bringing in two points per paragraph. And then what that means is if one of my marks is wrong, one of my points is wrong, or it's maybe not quite enough, I've almost got that extra mark as an insurance. Now, if you look at the gas. Um, paragraph that I've talked about here. So instead of the machine gun one where I give a further more point, uh, I give a however point. Some questions let you do however points, some questions don't. It really just depends on the question that you've got in front of you. For example, if the nine mark question was on the reasons why women got the vote, it's quite easy to do a however point, for example, for the suffragettes. You know, you could give a positive point for the suffragettes, helping women get the vote, but your however mark is saying something like, their targeting of shop windows, alienated business owners, losing them support. So it lends itself quite well to that. Where it maybe doesn't lend itself as well as for other things like uh, the impacts of the Defence of the Realm Act or the reasons why Scots enlisted to fight in the Western Front. So you need to make a judgment in that. But just know that you've got options that you can use, weapons in your arsenal that you can use for a nine marker to make sure that you give your best, yourself the best chance 
of getting um, getting nine marks. Uh, nine mark questions they can be asked in different ways. To what extent was the machine gun the most effective weapon in the Western Front? You could also be asked something like, how important was the appeal of Hitler and the Nazi rise to power? January 1933 right so it could be to what extent it could be how important how crucial was so there are different ways of this being worded so just be careful with that and always make sure that oops I will actually bring that back always make sure that you're identifying the isolated factor so for example in this one here the isolated factor would be the appeal of Hitler but what it's really asking you is why did the Nazis rise to power by January 1933 so always keep these things in mind, folks, when you're answering your nine mark questions. The final thing I've got in this presentation, folks, is just some useful links for you to look at. So what I've got here are past paper questions, <coughs> but also links to BBC Bite Size, both of which can really help in your revision at home. So we'll start off with the past papers. If you scan this QR code or you click the link that's attached, uh, just click that there, what is linked here is the past paper questions on the SQA website. And what you'll see here is you've got different past papers. So for example, 2023, 2022, 2019. Uh, just be careful when you're clicking these that you don't click the Gaelic versions um, unless you speak Gaelic. Uh, so you can access these and you can go and answer questions in your own time if you want to practice them. Uh, you can also ask your teacher because your teacher will have um, examples of past papers that go even further back than 2018 if you exhaust them the questions in here. So if I open up this one here, you've got the question paper. So here's 2023. And this is actually the way it's going to look when you guys set your exams in May. <clears throat> You'll be faced with this in the front cover. So total marks, 80, Scottish context, British context, European and world. And what it does is it has different sections laid out. And these are actually the different uh, topics that are done across Scotland. So some schools, for example, do the Wars of Independence, Mary Queen of Scots. Some schools do Change in Britain, uh, USA, 1850 to 1880. But we are looking for the sections that we cover. So what we cover is what we've got here. Oops, no, let me click. Uh, for section one, Scottish context, you've got part E, era of the Great War. So I would go to pages 12 to 13. For the British context, we do the Atlantic slave trade, 1770 to 1807, and it'll be pages 20 to 22. And then finally, we do Hitler and Nazi Germany, 1919 to 1939, pages 36 to 37. So what we do is I'd scroll right down past that, because what you notice actually is, on part A, if you were to start off with question one, you're looking at the wars of independence. Question one, describing the succession problem following the death of Alexander III. You're not going to know anything about that because we've not covered that. So you need to make sure that you're going down to our specific topic, which is all the way down here, part E, era of the Great War. So actually what you would be doing is you'd be starting on question 21. And that was describe the use of poison gas in the Western Front, which is quite tricky for a few of them last year. Uh, and you can answer these as you go through. Same if you scroll down. Oops. If you scroll down to uh, the British context. Uh, no, War of Three Kingdoms, it should be here. Source C, uh, part C, the Atlantic slave trade. And again, starting at uh, question 36. Scroll down again to Hitler and Nazi Germany and the European topic. Should be just the next one. Hitler and Nazi Germany. Right, so you've got options here for the questions that you do. Now, for the SQA website, what you also have access to is if you scroll down a little bit further, you have marking instructions. <clears throat> Feel free to use these, but what I would recommend you do is I would recommend that you go to your teacher so uh, to, to mark them instead of looking at the marking instructions because they know really where the marks can get picked up and where they can't. These might not make as much sense to you. So if I go down to example, where are we? Either of the Great War. Here's question 21. It doesn't give you the question, but we know it was the described question on the use of poison gas. On the right hand side here, you've got the possible points of knowledge that you can that you can uh, discuss. Again, these are points that you can use to check your own knowledge, but the best way to get the to ensure that you're on the right track is to take it to your teacher, who will make sure <coughs> that you're answering these in the correct format, in the correct way, and including enough detail each time. If I go back to oops, done here if I go back to the slides BBC Bite Size also offers some good um, 
some good resources for you guys to use. Obviously, everything's posted to the Google Classroom, so everything you need to know really is on there, but if you're wanting something that's a bit different, it looks a bit um, more interactive, uh, it might look, it might boil things down a bit more simply than what we go into in class. You can go here and all of our sections are on here on the BBC Bite Size website. So you've got Era of the Great War here, you can click, you've got the different sections, Scots on the Western Front, uh, you know, you could talk about trench warfare, you know, there's stuff in there about that. Um, you can also go down, you can look at um, Atlantic Slave Trade, it's in here as well. You've got the different contexts, you can click within those, you can get different information. And finally, you can go and look at Hitler and Nazi Germany. And you can look at the different aspects there. All those are there for uh, to help you folks, but know that you can always go to your teachers to get any extra resources, to get any extra work done, and they'll be the ones that can really guide you on best practice for revision going forward. But good luck for your exams, good luck for your prelims, and if you have any questions, remember you can always come to any of us in uh, D Corridor.